kick off this conversation with Amanda Bush and Roger Landry and uh, welcome them on. And Amanda and Roger, if you want to jump from behind the curtain, that would be great. And um, I am recording this. So if you want to share it or if you can't tune in for the whole thing, we'll, we'll be able to jump on the discussion. Uh, welcome, Amanda and uh, Roger. And the reason that we're doing this is actually this is a follow up to a panel that these two participated on called Five Trends for Senior Living in 2021. And that was an amazing discussion that we had. But what was interesting is, is that there was a lot of questions about Masterpiece, the, the company that Roger and Amanda work with. And so I basically said, hey, look, let's do a demo of what uh, Masterpiece is. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to learn more about this platform. But before we learn about the platform, let's get to know Amanda and Roger a little bit better. Um, Amanda, you know, the old saying, ladies go first, although that may not be politically correct anymore, but, but I'll, I'll roll with it. But Amanda, if you can um, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you landed in your position there at Masterpiece. Sure, so uh, my name is Amanda Bosky and I have been working at Masterpiece for seven years. And before that I was, um, my title was director of Masterpiece Living. So I worked for one of Masterpiece Living clients for five years before that. So I've been working with the Masterpiece Living product for about 12 years. Um, I, I have a degree in education. So diving into the senior living field was new for me when I moved um, to the community I worked for was in Michigan was called Holland Home. And uh, that's a little bit about me. I've learned a lot about senior living in the Great. last 12 years. And uh, and Margo, I see you're on the screen. I did you want to participate in the uh, in the conversation today? Or are you are you good just being behind the curtain? I'm good being behind the scenes. This is all Amanda and Roger. They're the experts here. Okay, great. Here, I'll, I'll just put you behind the curtain there. Thank um, you, Steve. Margo is a team member there at, uh, at, at Masterpiece. And so she can answer questions as well in, in chat and, and what have you. So now, uh, Roger, uh, tell us a little, little bit about yourself and the role that you play at Masterpiece as well. Steve, I'm happy to and happy to be on. Thank you for being uh, dogged about uh, getting more information. We, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to get our word out there. I'm a physician, a preventive medicine physician. I spent a, a career in the military, taking care of pilots, keeping them healthy and performing at their best, which is uh, preventive. And uh, when I left the military, I said, well, okay, where's the most bang for your buck in preventive medicine? Well, MacArthur study had just come out saying lifestyle was uh, the major determinant and we had a big demographic and I said it's older adults. So that's where I went and it uh, turns out my brother was uh, was uh, with the MacArthur Foundation at the time and so uh, he was in the midst of all that study himself and so uh, we got together we got a group together we started Masterpiece and I'm the president of uh, Masterpiece where he my brother is the chairman and oh. work with all these uh, very smart people to uh, help people have a healthy longevity. Great. Now, before we dive into Masterpiece, something on the previous discussion that I wanted to talk to you about, um, but didn't have the opportunity is, um, you. I think you've writ written several books, but one uh, title, Live Long, Die Short, is really uh, interesting and appealing to me. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the books that you've written, but specifically um, maybe give us a glimpse at some of the insights that you dove into in that book? Uh, I'm delighted. Who isn't delighted to talk about something they devoted a year and locked themselves in a room about? Uh, Live Long, Die Short, that title is uh, in public health terms, we would call that the compression of morbidity. So morbidity is when we're sick and impaired and we want to compress that time, right? We want to be highly functional and uh, until the very end of our lives, rather than go decades in decline and with and low quality. And, you know, Ashley Montague said it well. He said, die young as late as possible. <laughs> so, and uh, so the book is really my intent. 
there were so many books out there about uh, healthy longevity, successful aging. And uh, I was, uh, I wanted to piggyback on what Dr. Khan and Dr. Rowe had written in Successful Aging, their book, which changed everything. That was seminal work. But what I wanted to do was to sort of uh, drill down so that we got to the core of what it takes for someone to age in a better way. And, that, and then give practical tips on what that, uh, what, the, what that core is and how you can achieve that, those core requirements for us to uh, have a healthy longevity. 10 tips, you know, with Letterman, everybody's got to have 10. And uh, so uh, I gave, I broke it to 10 tips with some very practical uh, advice on each of those, uh, a way to uh, evaluate yourself with a little quiz. And through threaded through that was our story of Masterpiece, which started with the MacArthur study and has continued to evolve. Great. I, um, I'm just dropping the link to the book on Amazon for folks that might be interested in it. But the, um, the, the, what, one of the things that we talk an awful lot about is sort of the stigma of aging, the um, uh, ageism, you know, what have you. And I think that the title is, is interesting to me because I feel that what we all, we've all had loved ones that have had long periods of health issues. And we've sort of looked at that and, and that's how we tend to all define aging, you know, is, is that, um, and when you think about that compression of morbi morbidity, you know, is, is that um, some of us are gonna be lucky enough to sort of just kind of go to sleep one night and just not wake up. And, um, and then others, there's, there's no crystal ball, but others, it, it could be, a, you know, a 10 year period where you need to, reinvent yourself because of changes in your healthcare. And, um, and I'm intentionally not using the word decline because that's not what it is. This is just life and it's different for each of us, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, if we could somehow come up with a secret that, that shortens that, uh, that period, uh, man. It would well, be you know, it started with the MacArthur study and it is, it is not, it, I hope it's not a secret anymore, but we want to get it out to everyone. It's really the choices you make every day in a, in a holistic way, physical, mental, social, spiritual, you know, and uh, how you spend your time and it's never too late. And so uh, it's a stereotype that's an ageist stereotype to think that aging is only about decline. It is absolutely not. And we have something to say about it. We can chart our own course. I love it. Okay, well, this stems perfectly into, uh, I, I believe, what Masterpiece does. So the, the first thing that I want to uh, clearly define and understand is, in general, Masterpiece is supporting residents of senior living communities, correct? Or is there sort of a home-based platform? Well, when we started out, my brother took advice from uh, none other than Jonas Salk, who was on the board of the MacArthur study, and he said, start with senior living. And so that has been our focus. We want to inspire and cultivate growth, resilience, and purposeful longevity in residence. We, you know, we, uh, we can affect so associates' lives also, and we do, and their families, actually. But our prime focus has been within senior living for the resident. Uh, we intend to be able to, and we want to reach every adult, and we have been uh, working with uh, over the last year or so to, to uh, build a process that is going to allow us to do that. It'll be field later this year, but uh, it, we, we've been working, uh, we've worked with over maybe 40 million, uh, 40 thousand, sorry, we'd love it to be 40 million. I'm thinking in vaccine terms, uh, uh, <laughs> older adults in over 100 communities over the, these, this last decade. And uh, we've been tracking that progress. We have nearly 6 million data points that show we're on the right track. Great. All right. Well, let's, let's dive in and um, uh, tell us how all this works. Like, tell us the, the process and the experience uh, from the residents' end and from the providers' end, and uh, and then also how people can start working with you. 
Well, I'll start. Uh, and Amanda's going to give you the nuts and bolts because she, as she said, she's been in there in the community uh, and then she came to us. I'll give you the 5,000 foot one. I was in the Air Force and I'm known for that. Uh, and it was about since lifestyle is the major determinant, we have determined that. We wanted to give someone the ability to take a look at their lifestyle, the whole picture, the holistic lifestyle, get feedback on that, find out what they might be neglecting, and we're all neglecting something, and then be able to uh, work with uh, within the community uh, to, uh, to make changes with that. And we do that by supplementing the content and programming of the community. We do it with training so that the entire community is aware of what's possible because, you know, we're all ageist because we grew up in an ageist society and a term that is, very, is, is not meant to be ageist like the elderly or you're still doing that. These things can really hurt. And so we want to make sure. So training is involved. We track the progress with, uh, with the tools that we offer in order to take a look at your lifestyle. And again, we track that so that the individual can see uh, how they're doing. We aggregate that data so that the community can see how the community is doing, the community of residents and where the needs are. So maybe they want to put a little more into this kind of programming, the intellectual or whatever. We, uh, we train also in coaching. And uh, that's a very important part of lifestyle change that we, we all tend to bite off too much, like a New Year's resolution, and we fail and we give up. Well, you know, the Japanese have an excellent way, Kaizen, I'm sure you've heard of it. I have it in my book. It's about small steps. And so the coaching that we do is more, more like pulling in the reins a little bit and make sure someone is rational about it. And uh, so that's been, our, uh, that's been our approach with senior living communities with a partnership. And, and I'd like to turn it over to Amanda to tell what really works and happens. Yeah, and you know, just before Amanda jumps in, I really like what you said, and it actually piggybacks a little on uh, something that uh, Bill Thomas said yesterday in our discussion is, is that, you know, a, a solution, everybody's looking for that out of the box solution. It's sort of like, oh, I can subscribe to Masterpiece and all of a sudden all my engagement problems are taken care of. But what I like, he, he drew the analogy that you can build the perfect physical nursing home, but if you don't have proper culture change and training, it's it's not going to be the the correct experience. And it sounds like that masterpiece takes a similar approach. That it's not just your software; it's this holistic, all encompassing approach. And I guess Absolutely. Amanda, you're going to jump in on that now. Before she does, I'll just say that we started wanting to just work with the individual and very, very quickly saw that where you live does matter and that culture does matter. So. Amanda, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you gave a great overview, Roger. I, I, I would start just with the individual. So we have uh, two different opportunities, a lifestyle review, lifestyle profile. Um, which, as Roger mentioned, was an opportunity to take a look at all these different areas of your life holistically. And then we also have what we call a mobility review, um, soon to be, become one. Um, but those are both opportunities for the individual resident at a community to take a great look at where they are uh, and identify, okay, this is exactly where I'm at. This is where I might need to have some growth and this is areas that I'm really proud of or strengths that I have. And as Roger mentioned, they can participate in coaching um, to really identify those small continuous kites and steps um, for growth. And then again, at the, at the community level, we work directly with the team members at the community to identify on an aggregate level where they might be able to make a more supportive environment for all residents in the community. Yeah, so now is this, um, it sounds like sort of a questionnaire or an intake that is, is done. Is this done on a software platform? And is it done by a, a specific team member like the activities department or admissions or how is that uh, data on the residents gathered? 
Sure, that's a really good question. So we've been doing this for a lot of years and things have changed a lot over the years. You know, it was every single resident was completing it pen and paper and there was a, a bit of a, a job to get some of that data entered into the system. There is a system, residents can create their own accounts. They can complete the reviews on their own. Um, and we're growing a lot in the way that that technology looks and feels. So I hope that answers your question, but yes, it, it, there is a, a lifestyle questionnaire as a way to call it, um, and also a facilitated at this time uh, mobility review as well. Yeah, and it sounds, I, one of the, the things that I like about that is, is that oftentimes, let's say that you have 100 residents in a community it's very easy to just sort of or, or group them by ability only, or you know, if your community has a, a, a levels of care or something like yeah. that, it's sort of which is not appropriate. And and again, it um, it just sort of feeds uh, a a less than customized person center environment, you know, whereas I guess what you sort of can see is, is that when these are completed, that everybody is an individual, but there may be some common themes as opposed to sort of thinking that all the residents are gonna be interested in coming down for the stamp collecting discussion. You, you know, there really is only two residents that have an interest in stamp collecting. So that could be a one-on-one -on -one with some expert stamp collector. Is, is that sort of how this is utilized? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a really good question. So I would say that the, the questions are a little bit more related to healthy longevity. So they aren't into specifics necessarily about life enrichment type things. Okay. It's really okay. related to these areas of focus. So physical health, intellectual vitality, social engagement, peace and fulfillment. And we have two that we're adding. Those come directly from the MacArthur research that Roger's been referring. So um, comparing your lifestyle choices to what the research says will result in this healthy longevity journey. Um, but you're right, yes, um, organizations are able to look at it and they can say across the board, we have a lot of people who really need to work on lower body strength. So they can put some great initiatives into place at their organization to impact lower body strength. Um, that, that's really, really related to mobility, but it might also be um, indication of loneliness, which we're seeing a lot in the past year because of COVID. So they can put some really great initiatives into place. I work with a community I was just, just chatting with uh, yesterday. They had 0% of people saying that they were extremely lonely or um, quite lonely. Those were the two hmm. responses. 0% in the past year, which just blows me away. But they had that specifically set as a goal. They set up a phone tree that worked. So residents were calling residents, team members were calling residents, and they just went to town on this loneliness thing um, in the middle of a pandemic when people were feeling isolated. So um, well, that, pretty powerful. That, I, I love hearing that because as we all know, I mean, the senior living field, specifically the community field, has taken a huge hit uh, in this pandemic. And a, a data point like that is very encouraging and it speaks to the value of, it's not for everybody, but the, the value of making a move to a community if you are feeling lonely and isolated alone in your home or with your caregiver or what have you. It's not for everyone, you know, as you guys know, I, I endorse, endorse whatever's best for the person. And um, that's very encouraging. And two things that I, I, I admire about what you guys are doing is that you're, the concept of masterpiece, you keep on referring to research and data and um, it's, it's built on, it sounds like academic research, but I also like the fact that you are referring to data because so often I've seen in senior living communities is, is that we just make sort of this 
um, oh, everybody looks happy, you, you know, or everybody enjoys our, you know, bingo game or what have you. Whereas if you're <clears throat> putting data behind that, you can begin to really craft things to, to benefit the whole community. And Dr. Dr. Consti was, uh, who was with the MacArthur study and, and the, the book, uh, he, he was adamant that we, we wanted to jump ahead as soon as we had done a year or two of, of uh, pilot studies. But he said, no, no, I think we need more data. We need more data to show that this is actually working. Uh, a couple things uh, related to what you and Amanda have been discussing. Uh, this, uh, this pandemic, I think, gave us a lens. It gave us a lens to, 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 to focus in on things that we knew were important. But now we know, and we all know, because it's been very vivid, is very important. Things like social connection. We've already talked about loneliness. The relationship to nature, how important that was, you know, with pets and, 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 and getting out into nature. So uh, a lot of our messaging is going to be a whole lot easier after people have been through this pandemic. And uh, we have had so many residents tell us that they are so grateful that they were in senior living when this pandemic hit because they know what the alternative would have been and uh, that they just knew that yes it wasn't business as usual and it was a little difficult but they felt so much better so much connected uh than than they would have been so uh i think uh it's it's been a tough story for senior living but uh, i think there's some really wonderful things that we have found out from there Absolutely. No, I, I, I totally agree. And, um, and you just, we, we all have to look at it through a positive lens. And I know it's hard to, it's difficult to get people to move in, but I can see for in some communities, but I can see that having a platform like Masterpiece, how that can make it easier to um, sort of sell the benefits of a particular senior living community. Okay, so, so I guess, Step one, we've got the, the, um, the, uh, the data on each of the, the residents. Now, how does this translate into improving the lives of the, of the residents there? If you can walk me through that. Well, first of all, we give them the personal feedback. So the, 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 ba the baseline, they, they say, okay, uh, boy, I'm surprised. And we all take the lifestyle uh, profile also. And we, we learn things about ourselves. And they do. And, uh, and so then it's, oh, well, what do I do about that? I don't want to have be at risk for, uh, you know, uh, the, other than a healthy longevity. And so what do I do? And so that's where uh, the match content comes in. That's where the coaching comes in. And that's where the tracking comes in. And so we we can we can help them choose like uh, like there's a story I was uh, at a before pandemic I was at a wine and cheese little reception at a community and there were two uh, older residents speaking behind me and one of them said I really like these wine and cheese uh, get togethers and the other one says yes and isn't it wonderful that we're growing new brain tissue as we do it. <laughs> so we, we make them aware that, you know, some simple things, some simple choices they make can make huge differences that as long as we have a pulse, we can grow. And so it can be a modest, small step towards growth, uh, you know, uh, eating with someone new. Uh, once well, my mother decided to do that, she was very shy. And just, just once a week with someone new. She became the, uh, the head of the welcoming committee after a year. <laughs> uh, we, we can all grow. And that is a premise that, that is important for all of us to know, but particularly those who are in senior living. And, uh, and, and again, it may be modest, but uh, there's the ability to grow and the ability to build resilience, which again was another thing that the pandemic showed we absolutely need. And that comes from, uh, from uh, you pay attention to your holistic lifestyle. Great. So I think now I'm sort of being reminded of some of the questions that popped up on our previous conversation, because I, it because this is so holistic, it's hard to put what you're doing into a specific bucket. So correct me if I'm wrong, like this is not sort of like an activities platform, is it? It's and and how does it um, weave itself into the various aspects of living in the community. I'll let Amanda handle that one. 
Sure. So yes, uh, to answer the first question, um, no, it's not an activities platform. Um, it is a holistic approach. Um, Roger and I were actually just talking about this this morning because um, there's kind of three ways that we can approach it. So we have the, the full package that organizations would get, which includes all of the training, um, all of the content. We have several different turnkey programs that are related exactly to the topics that are covered in our lifestyle review slash lifestyle profile. Um, so if uh, the, the same way that I had mentioned, if you have a whole group of people that um, you learn may need to work on lower body strength. We also have the same thing about fruits and vegetables. So maybe you learned that a lot of people in the community um, aren't getting the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables in their diet. We have a program directly related to that um, to offer education around that. So we have several programs that are related specifically to the healthy longevity topics that are covered in the lifestyle profile. Um, that that's one approach. Um, we have training that's both for residents and for employees of the organization to really start to teach about these foundational concepts. Um, and I guess I'll stop there. Uh, Roger, anything you'd add? Yeah, uh, you know, the relationship that we've had was, was one, uh, was one type. And it was, uh, was a major investment uh, for uh, not so much financially as time. Uh, you know, culture takes takes a while. There's lots to do. And that's been our, our standard. But it's clear that some communities either for, you know, for because they don't have the finances or just uh, because or the staff or, or whatever, and particularly after the pandemic, we knew that we had to be much more uh, uh, nimble. And so we have the, uh, the ability to bring all of our tools, all of our content, all of our experience, our data and training to the community for and, and, and look at the culture among other things. We can just provide some content to them so to enhance their content, to enrich their content so that you know we're like powered by masterpiece behind their program, what they're offering. We can do that. And where we're going, we're very excited about uh, and it'll be the end of the year. And this is a this is a, a very personalized process because we've been hard at work building a content treasury, and it really is a treasury, that addresses all the areas of lifestyle. It addresses them in multiple mediums, from audio, visual, to text, and in, at different levels, depending upon where they are. So this will, uh, th this is what's going to provide someone supported autonomy, we like to say it is. So they're going to be able to chart their own course over the internet, take the profile, get the re response, be matched to data that uh, content and data and data tracking, but content that will help them to grow. They can continually track their progress. We're going to continue to add uh, content. Coaching will be part of it also. And uh, that, that's going to be uh, something that they're going to be in charge of. And it's going to be very customized. They're going, to, they're going to think this was made directly, absolutely for them. And really it is because of the way we choose. So those will be three ways that we'll be able to interact with uh, senior living communities. Oh, I, I love it. So the yeah, you've got this research back approach that a community can tap into. And then the beauty of this is, is that you're, you've got data points from a hundred of these communities that are, that all may or may not be affiliated to keep um, building on what's working uh, across all of these various communities. That, that's, um, that's, that's, that's true, Steve. And, and you've, you've hit on something that's very important. We're building a national data bank. I mean, with, you know, we have 6 million data points already and, uh, and, and building it every day. And uh, this, this is the aggregate of all the ones that we've been working with. And, and it, uh, it, it covers lots of lives, lots of experience. And so this is a very important thing that guides us in our content, in our approach, uh, and allows us to be uh, to, to be to be able to hone in on uh, the the particular needs of a community as well as the individuals. Great. Um, let's see. Eileen Wilkinson has her hand raised. I, sometimes that's by accident, but Eileen, if you had a question or wanted to ask something, just uh, open up yes. your mic. I did. I hit it accidentally when I started to type. After I was 
interested in how it's priced. Is it according to the size of the community as well as the package? Uh, you know, it sounds like you have lots of different ways that um, you can interface with your organization, but, you know, is this really geared towards um, the larger communities or, you know, could you do it for a small nonprofit? I was interested in the pricing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, yeah. Eileen. I was going to actually ask this the same question, uh, so I'm I'm curious. Uh, this, uh, this this pricing, even at its even at its highest for the biggest communities who want the most, this really comes down to no more than the, maybe the salary of a of a of a mid level employee at at best. This is very, uh, but it does vary depending upon the size of the community, uh, what they want, and but we are we have been dealing. Uh, uh, primarily with the uh, large community CCRCs in our initial years, but lately not at not at all. More and more, we're we're open to uh, to those even that don't even have independent living, but uh, but and smaller. And uh, we've adapted many of our resources so that they they are appropriate uh, for certainly for assisted living, but also from for the memory. And, uh, and to some extent, even skilled, because, uh, because again, we can always grow and just takes a little more creativity. So uh, no, there is uh, no community that we say, no, you're too small, you're too big. And, uh, and in fact, as we mentioned, we, we're, we're particularly uh, interested in those communities, and we have some within our network who are out with outreach, who are going out to the community and, uh, and offering resources to those people in order to expose them to what's happening in the community. You know, that, that's what builds you solid prospects, really. And so the outreach, and we ourselves want to outreach to more and more people who, whether they live in senior living or not, will stay in senior living. That's a great place to be. But there are a lot of older adults, as you said, Steve, who feel that, uh, you know, something different for themselves. is Well, yeah, I know a lot of communities are creating uh, separate organizations sometimes or uh or outreach, um, I wouldn't call it outreach, or um, a product line that is supportive to people that might not be ready to make the move yet. But um, when they do, they're gonna move to Shady Acres. So the, the concept here, if I'm hearing it correctly, is that in essence, uh, a community could sort of extend an invitation for somebody to go through the masterpiece product pro, uh, process while living in their own home and be part of uh, that, that community's sort of at home residence. Is, is that how right. it's done? That's right, Steve. Some of them call them CCRC at home. Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. You know, or, or outreach, or they have uh, health and wellness centers attached to their community, or they just offer, uh, you know, offerings, uh, continuing education, and and uh, or letting them use some of the resources within the community. All of those things. You're absolutely right, uh, because I, I think more and more communities are seeing this is a wise strategy. And uh, the new older adult is uh, is very savvy, and uh, and uh, they they know what's possible, and they know what they want, and so, you know, being able to as the supported autonomy, being able to be in control, and be and feel that it's personalized, that's important. The ability to reach them wherever they are uh, in their lifestyle journey, but also geographically, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's all very important. And uh, I, I I think that uh, more and more we're going to see outreach as a as not only as a major uh, prospect generator but also as as a way to uh, to help people through their aging journey now out of curiosity because you know we, I, I work with a lot of different communities and there's you know uh, I, I actually sort of feel that one sweet spot for a product like this is the smaller regional, communities that might not be part of a large chain where, but you can see both, but you see like with a lot of communities are out there, they sort of create their own brand, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, Shady Acres Lifestyle. And we've sort of done a bunch of research and we hired a, uh, an academic to kind of come in and create this just for our community. What you can see with this is that you've got more data, you've got more experience, you've got more 
everything that anybody can offer. Does, do communities ever, or, or do you white label it ever? In, in other words, that I run Shady Acres, I'm really don't want to sort of put the masterpiece brand first and foremost. I want this to look like it's something that I came up with. Um, uh, absolutely. An option. absolutely, Steve. That's exactly what we do. We didn't start out that way because when we started, most people didn't even have wellness programs. I mean, this has been, you know, over the last decade or decade and a half, this has just blown up. And they're, they're, people are doing excellent work. They're doing work uh, with, their, with their branded wellness programs. And exactly, our relationship wants to be down in the little corner here, powered by Masterpiece. This is just a way that we want to enrich their program with the, the things that the new older adult actually wants, namely, content that's customized to them, the ability to assess and track their performance, to go work with coaches, to, to, uh, to know that, uh, that they, uh, they're, they're in a, a process that's going to continue to grow with them. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and so we share our aggregate data with our network with every community that wants it. And so even a small one-off can, can get the best practices from, you know, multiple communities all over the country. It have been added a while. And certainly there's our experience also, but, and we, we connect them sometimes dietary with dietary, that sort of thing, you know, to get some good ideas. Uh, so this is a wonderful opportunity for someone who, uh, who isn't in a large system or have access to that to have access to a lot of experience. I would just add that even in a large system, though, the ability to white label it, it can still be their program that they've created their own research, and then they can support and add to it with our white label powered by Masterpiece. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, you can see where, you know, the amount that some systems have invested that where, you, you know, teaming up with you can make economic sense, but uh, functionally, because I think oftentimes we just get so, uh, it's why people join trade associations is that because, you know, you can get very isolated in your own community and not recognize that there's some other best practices out there. And I think that's what you, you can open the door to. Um, any sort of surprises that you, you know, that you have stumbled upon in this journey? Like it's sort of, like anything that's sort of like, I, I mean, I liked what you shared, uh, Amanda, about this community that has 0% isolation, uh, um, the, the residents reporting 0% that they, they feel isolated. But are there any things it, along the journey with Masterpiece that you're sort of like, whoa, didn't expect that, uh, that have really opened your eyes to the behavior or the, the lifestyle or the changes uh, amongst residents? I could tell you a lot of little stories. Um, oh, I, I love I'll stories. Just, yeah. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just start with the biggest surprise I had. Um, we ran match data. So we pulled out at all the participants who had participated in our lifestyle profile in basically the exact 12 months before COVID had started. And then the exact, you know, once we hit the, the year mark of COVID, um, we saw maintenance across the board and everything that we measured. So um, that, that doesn't necessarily represent the people who only participated one year or only participated the other, but the exact same people over time um, were maintaining their social engagement, their physical health, their, intellectual vitality, um, their, their spiritual peace and fulfillment, they were maintaining. And that, that surprised me. I mean, I think you heard in the media, you know, all of these stories of people being so isolated in senior living and just seeing these really hardworking, dedicated team members um, be so creative over the past year so that residents didn't experience this decline that we were speaking of. That blew me away. I was yeah. I was just oh, um, so excited. And I, I I know there are I know that this in order for that data to 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 deliver the results that you're sharing, it has to be holistic. Okay, there's no sort of 
secret, oh yes, we just, this is how we delivered our meals to people. But are there any sort of uh, standout programs that were out there that you feel may have contributed to some systems getting these high marks? Um, well, there are, there are many out there. Uh, uh, we uh, we uh, not necessarily partner, but we sort of co-market because we, we're in slightly different areas, but we're, we're all leading to the same thing. You know, the uh, Life Bio who talks about uh, their memoirs, uh, writing memoirs, which is a wonderful way for uh, someone to inculcate some meaning and purpose. Beth Sanders with Life Bio, she, she drives, uh, she, she assists people write a mem memoir and she, uh, she drives an intergenerational uh, product. Uh, where there's Eden Alternative, uh, we're very much along the same lines. Talk about Bill Thomas, you know, having started it. But uh, even as that has evolved, uh, we see that IN2L, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're in this area, but uh, we're in many communities together. And together, uh, I think it's larger than the sum of the parts, really. I think uh, Jack York will tell you that. And we, we say that also, wonderful products. And so we feel that uh, we're, we're just thrilled that there are so many people in this field. Uh, we, we like to think, of course, that we, we bring uh, the, the special attributes of uh, content, which is just exceptional, and, uh, and the data tracking that comes, building this national data bank. And, uh, and, and, and in our experience, of course, because we've been at it for just two decades, really, with our pilot and our beta testing. And uh, something I've been surprised about, Steve, is, uh, is the rapidity of the evolution of this field, the rapidity of what the new older adult who's walking into the sales center wants. And, and I'm, I'm approaching that time. I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm approaching that time and I totally get it. And when someone asks me, what does this new older adult want? I basically say, what do you want? And I don't care how old you are when you're talking to me. 40, because, because this older adult is so savvy, a 40, what a 40-year-old or a 50-year-old wants, it is very much in line with what this new older adult. And that is driving at the evolution of what's offered. I think we see a lot of it in the newcomers, the for-profits that are coming here. And, and it's making and it's requiring that the not-for-profits who've been in it for a century, some of them, uh, to, to rethink some very traditional things. This is healthy. And it's the way I think that we're going to have a larger impact on, on aging in this country. And, uh, and, you know, related to healthcare costs, related to that compression of morbidity, related to the high quality of, uh, of later life, and uh, to all of those things which will chip away in a big way at ageism and low expectations of, of, of being older. Yeah, oh, I love it. You know, um, something that we haven't touched on is the, and again, another benefit that I see with working with a system like this is the, the uh, enforce, or I, I don't want to say enforcing, implementing change with staff and with the team. So, you know, so often most of us in this audience have worked with an organization and change comes from down above. It's sort of like, all right, guys, we're going to do it this way. And, you know, you get that resistance. Most people don't react very well with change. I get, I'm assuming, again, going back to data, going back to the fact that you've done this with 100 communities and you've been doing it for so long, you've seen and you've been able to modify how you implement, because I, I imagine Masterpiece coming in, it's implementing change system-wide. And um, how, does, how does that work with, with the staff and any uh, any tips or tricks in terms of implementing system wide change, Amanda? You uh, want to well, I think in anything that you're doing in life in general, when change is coming about, that just setting expectations along with training and education is the biggest key. Um, we've learned that. Uh, I know that. As we, have, as we have learned different things, we've made it part of our own training and education to talk about resistance that might happen, readiness for change. Um, 
and even even on the individual level, I think that that's what's one of the the exciting things about um, where we're going with our lifestyle profile and this um, individualized content journey is that we're really focused on mindset. So if someone's not ready to change, that's what we're going to work on before we start implementing change. Um, is really being focused on mindset and and really small steps. Um, Roger recently wrote uh, an article about Kaizen and if the, if the change is small enough, it's a little easier. <laughs> um, a so I, I would say that um, and Roger. The, uh, and, and that's what we attempt to do, you know, with individual change, uh, we know it's more successful when you take small steps, but it's actually with organizational change too. Um, uh, I did a, 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 Mc, a McKnight uh, 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 Pete, uh, yeah, it, it was McKnight Pete on resilience and resilience, you know, has been such a big topic during the pandemic. So it was about resilience for the individual. Yes. And, and for associates even more so because we've seen they've had a hard time over this. So, and how do you build resilience, but also it was about resilience in the organization. And that is about uh, the, you know, the willingness to change, the willingness to assess the environment and see what's changing there. It, this, you know, who's showing up in the sales center? What's, what, what is the rest of the world doing? What, are, what is other uh, countries and what internationally what's happening? Because uh, I, think, I, I think we've all seen that that's, that's the way we see and that we lead the charge and we become resilient as an organization that we will continue to be in this market and continue to deliver a high quality product but you know Deming went to Japan a long time ago and he taught them about small steps to organizational and individual change and they it's the Japanese word is kaitsen and uh, and that's the basis of, of of how we talk about change and how we coach and how we teach coaching and uh, I, I think it's uh, it's a, it's a lesson we can all learn in life because that change tends to although a little takes a little longer is durable I wanted to tell a couple stories. So I'll just okay. say that, um, you know, so, so everything that we do is a process um, and that process can be adjusted a little bit here and there. So there's a process for the individuals and then there's a process for the organizations. And I'd been talking about loneliness earlier and I just wanted to, to say that there's really something to be said for when an entire organization gets on board and understands what goals are um, at your organization. So they're able to set lifestyle goals and say, hey, you know, we know that you're, you're in this business because you care about the residents and we wanna share what our goals are for impacting them. So I'm just thinking back, um, this is maybe five years ago, but I had a client that set the, that exact story of loneliness as a goal and they made a little form for all of those frontline people that are actually going into the rooms of the residents, it might be the maintenance team or the housekeeping team. Uh, and they had the story of this lady who had moved in, she was super social, um, she went to everything. And then she said to one of the gentlemen who was fixing something in her apartment, you know, I just can't connect here at the community. She's like, I feel so lonely and I just, I, I haven't been able to make any friends. Uh, I would say that on, on a media appearance, they would have thought that this lady was so happy there, um, but they were able to learn from those frontline people by being all centered around one goal that they wanted to accomplish. And they were able to connect her with some people that, um, that so she would feel less lonely. Um, and I love it. You I, know, yeah, yeah, this, you know, the, I hate to keep on referencing Bill Thomas, but you know, He's an icon. You can't avoid he, he it. He really is. And, <laughs> and, you know, that's, that speaks to the value of a universal worker is, is that it's it, it, creating a culture where everybody is involved and engaged. It's so often people are in silos and they miss those opportunities and they aren't communicating with upper management, but, but you can see where the value of this of this this culture the other thing that that i want to reference that that bill thomas was talking about at the beginning of the pandemic is how much the residents are going to play in the radical change of these communities and what i like about the masterpiece system is 
it's not just a t like that everybody is on the same team like it's it's um it's a, it's a system that can get everybody on the same on the same team versus okay we're on this side of the curtain we're the staff and and we're serving those people on this side of the curtain it's it's people are coming together and all being involved in the common goal to create a, a healthier, vibrant community. Um, this is I'll, great. I'll tell one more story. So just okay, great. It, um, and then we're, we're, I can't believe that we're at the top of the hour here. So if anybody wants to jump in with any other follow-up questions, but let's, uh, I'd love to hear this story and then uh, we'll make sure to uh, share this recording and everything. Absolutely. So one other thing that we talk a lot about, and I can't believe we haven't mentioned today, is this idea of human capital. So it's the skills and the ability, the experience, the, the this wealth of wisdom that we have from older people. So um, one that's one thing that we really pr promote at communities, both with residents and then also the people who work there. What are What's your human capital? What can you share? I think it relates really closely to this universal um, worker that you'd mentioned. We have this um, story where, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, human capital, let's have a resident get up and lead a program. But I had a community that I worked with that they really wanted to just connect people with skill sets and things that they wanted to accomplish. And they had a resident who lived in skilled nursing, had never learned to read or write. And they had a teacher, a retired teacher who lived at the community who um, had wanted to share her skill of teaching. So they paired them up one-on-one -on -one and, and she taught this, this resident in skilled nursing how to write her name. Um, just really beautiful story of by using um, human capital educating on it and sharing the power of sharing human capital, you can really connect people so that they have these really beautiful experiences. Um, and I'll end with that. <laughs> I love it. And, and you know, really, I, you can see where a system like Masterpiece or whether you, you subscribe to Masterpiece or you create a homegrown system where you just really document and use data and, and enable it to unlock those, those things. Because if you don't create some sort of documentation system or subscribe to something like Masterpiece, you're gonna miss those human capital opportunities. There's no way, because you know, we've all seen it. Where is it? It's in the head of the activity director. And it's, and a lot of times he or she is missing these opportunities because, um, they're running around implementing programming, but uh, having a tool like this can just r really unlock am amazing doors to make a community a more vibrant place. We tend to make uh, decisions in the community level based upon the people we see every day who are out there doing it. And, and we yeah. get very optimistic about what's happening. And, but we don't see those who aren't coming out of their apartments or, or, or are struggling. And so this is, this is an opportunity to, to reach more and more people and to uh, grow as a community. I love it. Um, hats off to you guys. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to jump in and, and get to know Masterpiece in more detail. And um, I will share all your contact information with the audience, the recording, podcast, what have you, and uh, stay in touch with us. I, I, I want to, you know, as these developments occur towards the end of the year, uh, we'd love to have you back on and learn more about that. Uh, we'd, but, uh, we'd, we'd love to talk, talk about it. We're very excited about it. And uh, just be a few more months. All right. Uh, thanks, Roger and Amanda. And we'll be talking to you soon. Steve, thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks Bye. for what you do.